submitting uh, billing again and uh, I'm wondering that's it's kind of a problem because we want to know how much we're investing in the uh, shed and so I ask at least an update of ours even if he doesn't bill um, I think that's important because this is one of the most significant capital expenditures that has been made in this district for a real long time. Secondly, and this is consistent with other comments I've made, um, the revenue side of the equation seems to be missing and without targeting revenues and understanding what's making us money, you know, what things are costing us uh, is kind of irrelevant. So um, I would ask for a more in-depth reporting uh, than what the consent calendar offers us. That's all. Um, thank you. Um, I will call the question on paper. Aye. 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 Uh, we'll move to item D, which is the public comment um, open line for items not on the agenda. And I would imagine that's the reason why we have people in the audience. So um, who would like to take first stab? Um, so, as it relates to the pension crisis, which is obviously concerning for new homeowners that are with, with property taxes, I guess my question is, is overall long term, I guess for this year I think it's 50k-ish profit, this year we have 70k somewhere around there, and given whether it's $5 million of the unfunded liabilities or $8 million, I guess my question is, is I would love to understand what the options are in terms of operationally what we're doing in terms of whether it's new rev outside of increasing property taxes is there doubling camp size and things of that nature that we can that that are in the mix that, that is good to understand and how the community can help in that. Um, our resident expert on the pension is Jeff Naylor who has done tremendous work for uh, the district and I I think thanks to him, the board has never had more clarity on what's facing us and what we can do. And uh, I think everything that we can, we are doing already. Um, but specifics, I mean, I think we don't call it. Oh, sorry. This is open time. Okay, so I guess I would love to learn operationally what we could be do what we're thinking about doing differently in terms of how we're operating within the district. I guess that's just an open question. Of um, excuse me, your name is? My name is Eric Bingham. Okay, if you don't mind, I'll reply to you offline. I would love that, thank you. Okay. Um, and then I guess the second question that I have related to the landfill or land piles or landscaping that's next to the maintenance shed. I guess I would love to understand operationally, it's one area that I've been confused about relative to how, call it 400 square feet of debris will fit inside the yard along with the, the large truck, the trailer, and also the, the back loader, and how all of that, the actual mechanics can be successful in that small space. So I guess that's my biggest question, and I don't know if you guys follow next door, but Bill gave some additional color on that, and he mentioned in another 
he mentioned the existence of another site for potential storage and for the maintenance operations to adjust as necessary. So I'll just quote just so I, um, I'm honoring his, his comment. He said, there are er other areas not on the site available for temporary tree trimming, so the staff will revise their use of those as needed. And I would just love some clarity of what are these other sites that, that I was, wasn't aware of as part of this um, approval process. process. That's it for me. Again, I don't think we're supposed to have a back end for okay. it, so um, the, my, thank no, you for my, your concerns. I just want to know my concerns. Um, I think the best way would be to uh, forward them to Eric okay. um, via email, and um, I'm sure he'll do his best to, to answer them. Gotcha. Thank you. Nothing further. Thank you. Uh, do you have anything to say? No, I think I have to kind of follow what you were saying. Oh, okay. Oh, I, I have something to say. First of all, uh, actually, happy time here. Uh, we had a real eventful month with the blackout, uh, Halloween. Um, I got to know some of you a little bit better, and that was really a joy. And I look forward to working uh, with everyone going forward um, I still have you know concerns uh, <coughs> uh, in the safety uh, review uh, specifically and also the shed um, and I, I guess we can address that later um, but I wanted to congratulate Eric uh, you're finally at the point where you've got the uh, plan I guess accepted with the uh, now that you have the uh, 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 story polls up and this is a really uh, a great opportunity right now um, to test drive the facility see literally how the space is going to fit the maintenance shed needs um, take it from me I've built a few boats uh, some uh, some cabins and stuff I, I understand how stuff works and uh, a lot of times it's not until you get to the full scale you really understand how things uh, work and this will be a good opportunity for example uh, one of the allegations I've met uh, I've made or comments I've been making is it's going to be really hard to move vehicles there so there's an opportunity to take the space that you have right now put out some cones and then just try backing up the vehicle, turning around the vehicle, doing the stuff that you need. And um, it'll, I, in fact, I encourage each one of you to try to back up a 20-foot uh, trailer uh, with a 22-foot truck. Um, I think you'll be quite surprised at the challenge that that uh, presents you. Um, but that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. I want to follow up on what Steve said, and that's regarding the uh, blackout. It's got to happen again in the next few years, I would think. The reason I mentioned it, my business was uh, emergency generators. And I always talk to uh, Cameron Case about CERT. You know, you should, it seems to me there should be an emergency power source here as a community center. I don't know if there is. I don't know if you have plans for that, but since it came up, it's worth talking about. Chief, didn't you guys have your doors rolled up during the time? I mean, if you can't even roll up your your doors, I mean, it seems like there should be 50 or 100 kW. It doesn't take that much space. It might cost, I don't know, $30,000 to invest in it. It might be something worth for the community. Just to put on lights where somebody can come, or, you know, the, the cell phone deal was a, a big uh, problem. Place for uh, residents to, you know, charge their phones or something. Just a thought. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Having heard from the public, we'll move to the district matters, which is um, item E, and we'll start with one, which is the public hearing um, on the adopting and modifying the California Fire Code, International Fire Code, and Appendix A of the International Wildland, Wildland Urban Interface Code. Uh, we'll start the public hearing uh, with the Chief maybe giving us a short presentation or update or a summary, is that okay? 
Uh, yeah, he can certainly give you an update in the summary. In terms of the public hearing, it's, it's precisely for that. I would call it uh, the you know, public hearing to session. It is a chance for the public to make comment. It isn't necessarily a, a time for dialogue. Dialogue can come in the next agenda item. It is simply for them to have comment and then for that to be entered into the record. Okay. Nice. But with that said, the chief can certainly provide a intro to it. I, I think a short intro would be lovely. Great, thank you. Uh, this is a, a three-year update to the fire code and building code, which is we don't take action and adopt the code with amendments. The state will require that it's done at the first of the year. So it's an opportunity to have a correlation amongst uh, our neighboring agencies. The fire prevention officers have been working for the last uh, three, four months and ensuring that um, the code is similar. Uh, and so the updates here that are being recommended are also being done throughout um, Marin County. So with a very few exceptions and some of the agencies are not even aware of the specific details. Everyone's essentially adopting a model uh, ordinance here. There's no significant changes um, to the code. There have been some clarifications relative to conflicts and potentially where there were um, uh, code language that may be confusing. Um, those have been resolved, which is, um, I think, helpful to everyone. It's predominantly uh, a building-related code, and then the, the fire code, which includes everything from means of egress and how to deal with uh, crops and vegeta vegetation, um, is in, in the interest of occupant safety, so uh, life safety hazards, uh, life safety systems, um, there are uh, some changes relative to vegetation management, but none that are significantly uh, different from those that we currently have. And I can answer any questions that you may have for the public. Well, thank you very much. So since the public hearing, let's open it for the public to comment and give us opinion. Stephen? Yeah, uh, so there are changes, uh, Chief, and how are we to know what the changes are? We've illuminated um, some of the, the, the changes that they're, they're pretty significant in terms of the overall um, fire code. Um, the changes are considered not substantive, <coughs> and um, so we're glad to go Good. through and highlight some of those. I can tell you um, that some of them um, have to do with ensuring that uh, when structures are uh, rebuilt, um, that they're done in a way that's consistent with the building code. There were some problems with the language there. Also with vegetation management, um, we've ensured that uh, there's correlation amongst all the different agencies. Uh, so there may have some detail that's listed in there relative to clearance from roadways, clearance around structures, um, we didn't get into any of the specifics that you may have read about in terms of uh, some things that Mill Valley's been involved with, which is a, essentially eliminating plants when doing certain distances of a structure. So, and again, this is done in a consistent way with uh, exactly how Warren County is adopting the code as well. Thank you, Chief, for the clarification. I have to say it was a challenging read, and now seeing this binder makes me even more uh, may, may I continue count, count yeah so um, I, I I hear what you said and I unfortunately I I hate to ask you but I mean really I, I don't think that there's any analysis that can be done if we don't know what the new inserted language is um, one of the things that caught my eye not that I'm in the business of doing this was were, were all the uh, permitting requirements and to me when I hear permit 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 I hear uh, you know tax tax fee 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 tax and um, I understand you know health and safety obviously is 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 critical but it just seems to me you know approval of this is really approval of a collection of fees and we don't even know what the fees are so it, it I mean, I just, I, I realize you want to get a yes answer tonight. I just don't think it's ready for prime time unless the specifics are known and can be weighed 
uh, objectively. Um, and that's that's all I have to say. Thanks. Without the local amendments, would actually give you a little greater latitude on some of the areas. It doesn't necessarily minimize, uh, but in some areas that are subject to interpretation, um, they worked well for us in the past. And again, there's no substantive changes from the current code, including all the permit requirements. And as you probably can, uh, as you look through those listings, many of them are not applicable. They just don't apply based on the nature of the composition of the district. Well, again, thank you for going through this scary reminder. Uh, may I have a motion from the board? So moved. And second. Second. Thank you. Any um, public comments? No? We just concluded the public hearing. I'm not sure if oh, you'd like to comment. Oh, uh, I thought this was a separate item. Yeah. Um, well, okay. Uh, my comments are similar. Uh, you know, to categorize it as light, medium, or heavy is really, it's, it's meaningless. Um, it needs, these, these things, these are very specific asks and um, requirements, and we should have specific information in front of us, um, and we don't have that. Uh, I, you know, it's easy to get things do things fast, but I think it's uh, an obligation to do things thorough. I can provide some additional updates. Um, each of the amendments in the ordinance are rollovers from the 2016 code to the letter. Um, new vegetation standards are pending as the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority uh, unfolds, so therefore no uh, changes have been made relative to vegetation. Um, other changes in the code were just based on what the state took action. There's a state code and an international code and some wording changes and clarifications to make the code less susceptible to multiple interpretations. And the geographical limits are necessary only to help justify local amendments, that mean, the uh, climatic, uh, geographic, uh, and topographic. Um, the ordinance does not change any of the existing rules for automatic fire sprinkler systems. And again, there are no uh, substantive vegetation changes. And there, because there are no changes, there's no CEQA impact. Uh, County Council has also vetted um, the, uh, the code for uh, Marin County and approved that. And appendices, uh, and the reason they're listed, and that's been done for a legality um, that are included in the code, that's the first time that they've been done in this um, process in the past. They were adopted by reference in the past, but it's been recommended that they be listed <coughs> in case there's an applicability. Um, I think fireworks, other activity that might be included in there that might be used. Um, and then, as I mentioned, uh, everyone worked to try to minimize the impact of making any significant changes and try to ensure correlation among each agency. So it was really, no matter which agency you were involved in, and this makes it good for residents and good for businesses. Why should you have a completely separate you know, set of codes if you're operating and starting a business in Marinwood or a section of the county or San Rafael or Novato? So there's a lot of work done at what we call code correlation. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 
and we passed the ordinance. Uh, moving on to fiscal year 1920, first quarter profit and loss budget to actual and variance report. We are just reviewing um, the turnout. Eric, would you like to present please? Yeah, sure. I gave you a fairly detailed staff memo uh, leading into this. Uh, you know, kind of pointing towards the drivers of our revenue as well as our uh, expenditures. I also tried to do some prior year comparisons in my staff memo just to give everybody a sense of where we were at this same point last year. Uh, and as known, last year we finished uh, from an operational financial perspective quite well. Uh, I anticipate uh, more of the same. Uh, I also uh, wanted to make note, if you look at the bottom uh, of my memo, the second half, of, uh, you know, as of October 31st, which was a month into Q2, um, our cash holdings in our treasury fund was stated at approximately 2.13 million, uh, which is an increase of almost a full million at the same point in time, uh, year over year as compared to last year, um, which is nice. Um, so we've actually been able to kind of double that for two years in a row now. Um, so from a cash management perspective, um, we are operating in behaving in a very sound financial manner. It is also uh, important to note that of that total holding, uh, I have another note in here regarding capital expenditures that uh, the district board has designated 200,000 of the above, 100,000 from each of the past two fiscal years, uh, derived for capital reserves, uh, with another $100,000 designation to be uh, potentially made at the close of this fiscal year. So that is incorporated into that $2.13 million number. And then I also gave you a note regarding our OPAD trust fund, which was uh, has been in existence for a little over two fiscal years at this point, with 60000 going into it uh, as far as cash contributions uh, two fiscal years ago, another 100000 last fiscal year, and we continue to make monthly contributions at the end of the year will total another hundred thousand uh, but I gave you a balance in there as of the end of Q1 of 191,000 based on cash contributions of 176,000 otherwise uh, I tried to spot any things I thought you might have questions about and leave those in the variance notes at the end so I am happy to uh, ask you about that or answer any questions I would reiterate this is simply a snapshot of operations from quarter one. Just because we finished the quarter, by no means uh, means that every line item in here should be exactly 25% progressed through. Um, some things we spend all the way up front, some things none of it gets spent until the end. Monies come in at very specific times that we're well aware of when they come in. Um, that said, again, everything is on record and on track and actually, if not performing, even better than it has in the past fiscal years at the same point in time. Thank you very much. Questions from the board? Uh, just a comment. Um, this quarter we received no um, special assessments or tax revenues. So right. that's why we have zero across the line for revenues. Okay, Those will show up in the second quarter when we do the second quarter statements. And also I wanted to mention with regard to actually making pre-funding above and beyond the um, as-you-go for OPEP, it has a very significant impact on the discount rate for our um, unfunded liability for OPEP, which reduces it. And so that is, uh, we're not paying off the entirety of the uh, annually required contribution. We are putting a dent in it, but it does slow the amount of um, the unfunded liability that we'll end up um, having for OPEP as well as the pension. I can follow up on that. Mm -hmm. um, as of our last actuarial study, which obviously actuarials take effect usually about a year after a given date, we going to do the study. Based on the establishment of that fund, the monies that have gone into it, as well as the board's policy uh, to dedicate a minimum amount or to contribute a minimum amount or unfunded OPEB liability during that time is actually fallen by approximately $2 million. Excellent. And again, that all thanks to Jeff for doing tremendous work enlightening everybody about this issue and then Eric to you for excellent management of our finances. Thank you. Public comment on PNL. Um, let's thank Stephen first for change and then oh. And you're always taking me. I, I don't mind being second, but uh, um, 
So, uh, yeah, the real estate market did great uh, the last couple of years, and sure, surely our uh, taxes are reflecting that. You know, one of the problems I have with this particular report is it doesn't segregate uh, the tax revenue from the business revenue. Am I correct on that, Eric? No. Um, so business operations really need to be thought of as a separate uh, a separate center that where the costs need to be evaluated uh, in a different form than uh, other things like you know paying off our uh, our bonds, etc. Um, it's really hard, I you know, with this report to really understand uh, you know how well did a uh, the lifeguard program do this year, for example, or the the you know, uh, specific uh, spe specific classes. Everything is kind of jumbled into a, a large number where you really cannot get to the details. It, it suggests that um, it suggests that everything's fine when it may not be. I mean, if we're we're doing activities that we're losing money in or barely making uh, a profit, to use that business term, maybe we shouldn't uh, be risking our capital in that. We need to make sure that uh, uh, things like our pool, these large capital expenditures are being banked as well as, of course, the overhanging uh, pension issue, which uh, is your legacy. Um, there's several legacy items that you guys are dealing with um, that your names will be attached to. and. I hope um, you know do do the community justice. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Of the relative to the there's 2.1 million dollars on the books. We have an estimated balance of the measure A funds as part of that 2.1. Uh, the measure A balance is not actually part of the 2.1. They're held in a completely separate fund. Um, and right there. I don't know that I wrote it down for the purpose of this report, but I know that I reported what I anticipated it to be back in June. And shoot me an email, I'll tell you what the balance is of it, so I'm going to be able to And And I guess my second question is, is, do we have a sense of the receivables for Measure A going out, whether it's this year or following years? We do have a sense of it, um, and we usually get an estimate a um, year, uh, for a couple of months ago. Uh, in terms of receivables, yeah. uh, they usually come in shortly before June. Yes, yeah, they've uh, generally been roughly ninety thousand a year for the district. And is that in perpetuity until there's a, a voter bond that changes that? No, it expires in like 22, 23, I think. Uh, but there's a lot of talk that it will be placed back on the ballot again for another uh, round. It's a sales tax related measure. Not a, pro not a property tax related, but thank you. Nice. Anybody else? Alrighty, that concludes our PL section of the report. <coughs> we're going to move on to item four, which is the district manager report. Okay, I have a couple of notes that I put in here. One, uh, just regarding the health rates, and especially since we recently kind of produced. A bit of an informal calendar. Typically in January, we would see uh, resolutions to set the employer contributions for health. Uh, as I explained in this, our rates uh, remain almost 100% stable, changing by less than I, I think the number was 0 0.003%. Uh, and that was because CalPERS, who we contract to for our health benefits, used to have five regions, they consolidated those into three regions, one being a much larger Northern California region of which the Bay Area rates were already the highest, so they brought everybody else up to the Bay Area. Uh, some areas experienced massive increases, while we remain the same. Uh, I would expect it to go back to more of their standard 4 to 5% increases again next year, but as such, it had zero material impact on employer contributions and with that, we do not need to provide another resolution stating that we are maintaining the same contribution levels that we currently have. That resolution is fine. It doesn't have to happen every year, only when you want to change. Um, secondarily, 
on the park maintenance facility, uh, as you may have noticed and or uh, seen or heard, uh, there are story poles up, um, and as Stephen mentioned at the beginning, that is that was the final piece that we were waiting on getting done uh, for our design review application. I reiterate in here, design review is a county process. It is not a district process. Um, at this juncture of this project, they maintain uh, and control all communications, all notices, all determinations. Um, and we are just kind of waiting on that. I am anticipating speaking with the planner. Ideally, at some point this week, we're trying to set a firm time and date that to speak so I can get a much more clear understanding on timing of next steps, which hasn't uh, been readily provided. I will say, uh, finding a qualified contractor who was both willing and available to do this work was an incredible challenge and it came together very quickly at the end when we found one and said I can put it I can do this job in a couple days from now or a few days from now or I can uh, do this job in mid-December uh, so we took him and he was qualified for the job he actually was much cheaper than some other people who had given us loose estimates as well um, so they are up they're done they were all done by a qualified contractor based uh, in accordance with the story poll plan that was submitted to the county. Finally, uh, just a little update on what's happening with the LAFCO working group uh, in terms of fire service. We did have an initial meeting. Uh, it involved city staff from the city of Santa Fe, myself, as well as the county of Marin and the executive officer from LAFCO. Uh, it was a good meeting. You know, I am looking forward to some of our next steps here. Uh, again, we are just looking at what all are the feasible options available to us? What are the legal and or technical steps? We're also, uh, each agency is researching uh, through their various actuarial contacts, uh, potential costs to perform studies for things like pension impacts as well as other OPEB impacts uh, so that that is kind of more clearly laid out. Um, and then we plan to meet again in early December uh, with hopes to have more detailed information early into the next year. Uh, needless to say, everybody that was also working on some of these items were kind of key players involved in <coughs> the work around power shutdowns and that kind of pushed us all back a little bit. So, uh, but it is progressing and uh, I commend the Executive Officer of LAPCO who is continuing to make sure it is pushing forward. Any issues comments or questions from the board to the district manager? Um, I'd just like to mention with regard to the uh, maintenance facility, um, I'd like to ask if there's some way that we can get out the, or resend the links to the actual information um, that's on the Marin County site and is also on our own site so that um, we get past the subjective information that's being um, published in you know, in next door for the most part, and we start to um, talk about factual information so that we can all be talking about the same issues, the same facts. Um, at this point, it seems like there's a little bit more subjectivity and emotion as opposed to factual information that's being bandied about. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. Can so, I, can I follow you up with that? Please. I actually posted something on next door from the district account shortly before this meeting, this uh -huh. evening. With those very links, um, and I also posted a brief explanation as to why the district staff and board will not, uh, does not uh, practice engaging in other random social media chains, such as the one, here. not random, but other social media chains. So, okay, so okay. Right. Sorry. I mean, uh, Quite all right. Ahead, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's been put out there with links to both the district page as well as the county page, a clear explanation that it is a county process at this point in time, and also with a clear invitation to. Uh, uh, family up. And I'm happy to sit and meet with anybody regardless of uh, support or post or just simply want clarifying information. Uh, if it's all there, we're going to have a uh, civil uh, engagement conversation. Happy to sit with Very good. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, well, first of all, with regard to health rates, um, 
and everything else. We have expanded our number of employees, uh, which do represent a long-term liability. Um, I, I just, I think we don't, we don't have a handle on the long-term effects of some of the decisions that are being made today. With regards to the uh, 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 next door, for example, I, I did, did want to address that. Uh, if you are using uh, Nextdoor as a semi-official uh, communication platform, please stop. It is not legitimate, um, and it's you know I'm banned from Nextdoor, as you well know, and I guess you're all you're all happy with. But but for me, it's very uh, troubling when uh, there's a tax being made on my positions. You characterize uh, uh, people who have a different opinion than you, Jeff, as not having a legitimate uh, opinions. And I think that's really, you're, you're, you're not playing fair with that. I think the official communications need to come from an official source, from an official list that people subscribe to. So, um, you know, otherwise, really what you're doing is uh, propaganda, which is really not something I don't think you want to be associated with. With regards to the park maintenance facility itself, um, I'm glad that uh, facts can now be discussed and I urge each one of you to walk down there, look at the truck, look at the trailer, and, and, and mentally uh, drive that trailer through that facility and you will see exactly what we're talking about as far as access. Um, there's a huge impact being made. Now this is your legacy. Your names are going to be on this. I'm sure you, you guys don't want to be associated with the boondoggle, but um, uh, there's time currently to make the right decisions. Um, we had some good ideas from Irv Schwartz. I think, uh, you know, it shows both maturity and wisdom to be able to evaluate facts and change a position if necessary. So um, I just, I, I'm, I'm very troubled that the way that this uh, maintenance facility has come out because uh, we have been denied a really full open public hearings. You guys are, are uh, characterizing that, but we wanted a, a, a real fair, uh, town-wide um, forum where pros and cons could be discussed, alternatives could be discussed, and we were denied that. Instead, we unfortunately hired the ex, uh, an ex-CD, uh, CSD uh, director, which uh, may have some legal replications uh, to come. And we want to make sure, everyone wants this facility, we just want to make sure the right facility is is uh, being created here and uh, uh, and at the end of the day no one in this room is going to be able to move that truck through that facility as described if you've never tried to to back up a 40-foot truck uh, on a wiggly path you, you really just have no concept so. We, we haven't expanded staff that are applicable to pension or bulkhead. We've actually reduced staff within the last year. We've got two firefighting positions, and uh, prior to that, we've got 40% of the park staff as well, and those are the positions that qualify. Um, Part-time staff don't qualify. No other full-time staff positions have been created that are applicable to either pension or bulkhead. Thank you. Just simply to clarify. Yeah. Um, we'll Thanks for clarification. Item F. Uh, which is the draft minutes of the fire commission meeting of November 5th, uh, November 5th. And um, are there any questions for the chief from the board about the fire commission meeting? Or the other yes? Question? Uh, is there the. Uh, um, now active people 
they're going out there and they're um, working with homeowners with regard to you know, hazard evaluations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. I, I asked this last time and I didn't follow up. Who do I need to call? No, no. <laughs> 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 um, how, how do I request having? It's not so much my property. It's the property next to me. They've got um, for my six to eight feet in the board and make sure <coughs> that we post it so that everyone. Oh, okay. Can take it. Yeah, we've got some juniper bushes that are much taller than I am. I don't think we would. I'd like to have somebody take a look at. So, with regard to with regard to the. Um, the power outage in this and that. Um, perhaps it's a little bit off, off the wall, but was Miro working just fine during this? Yes. Good. Very good. Work. Good. I'm glad. And we had, uh, you know, we've got the copper for our telephone systems here in this in this building, so that continued to work. Um, and the battery backup for the, I'm sorry, the generator um, was able to keep the uh, fire station operation. Yes. Correct. Yes. That was sort of the limit of. Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, fair enough. I was glad to see people down here and uh, welcoming people who had questions. And that was uh, excellent. Uh -huh. hmm? I go all over. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Thank you. Anybody else? You can just send me your elbow next time. Anybody else? Uh, I don't know if I want to bring it up here or at the end of the meeting, but uh, I'm graduating Chief Gray on his upcoming retirement, and I was wondering what the ramifications are. Is Chief Gray gone? I have a cell phone. That's definitely <laughs> <laughs> Who's taking the place? How oh, things are going to move along? Uh, we can cover that with Chief Report. Yeah. I was about to can I, I'll just make a comment that I just wanted to thank our firefighters and our volunteer firefighters for <coughs> all their help during the power shut off and the questions that people like me came to beforehand. Um, <coughs> if we could maybe <coughs> if there's frequently asked questions, maybe have those up for the next power outage. <coughs> Is it so for me? For me, I found out <coughs> the night before I needed to start analyzing my daughter the day of the power outage four times a day. And I was like, how do I nebulize a child without any power? And you guys gave me the wonderful idea of going on Amazon and getting a plug in for the car. It's so like maybe those little things that people come to you that can make a prep ahead of time, like a frequently asked questions. It was really helpful for me. And Amazon delivered during power. <laughs> so we are still on the draft minutes of the commission meeting, and we'll take comments from the public. <coughs> I'm not sure if this is the right place, but it's, I'm going to have a comment along the lines of. Savan, um, uh, you know, everyone I know who was was pretty pissed off at that, especially this, I think the second day when winds were really calm. Now, I don't think we actually control it. I don't know how the decision making get gets done, but certainly from a communication standpoint, um, you know, I had a medical device, I had battery backup, good lithium battery backups. And I was out of power by the second day. I didn't buy a solar charger. I now have a solar charger. But uh, it thought occurred to me, I'm not the only one. Um, I have a neighbor who has recently come back from rehab after uh, a broken hip. And she must have been walking around in the dark. It was a dangerous situation. And so um, I, I, I fault myself because I didn't actually think about it until just now, but there should be some sort of communication bulletin board or something posting exactly the, the kind of information. We can't rely on the internet. We can't rely on power. We, we, we need to go back to the old-fashioned uh, 
you know, press the flesh and uh, reading notices. Um, that was the only thing that worked long term. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm introducing us now, but I, I guess I, I'd like you to hear that and hopefully someone uh, will take that up for our community because I think it was lacking. I think we all learned something. I think uh, it's, a, it's a great idea and it would be great if you could share it with the fire commission because that would be probably the best way to proceed with this project. Yeah, I mean, they did have um, boards up with updates on the power outage. And in in like front that. of the firehouse? They had, what, was it the firehouse in front of the yes, we did. police center? Yes, yeah. as a kind of information center. And I know that a lot of people are coming up and asking questions, but I was just thinking like a little thing that maybe in the fire magazine that goes out, like, yeah. Think of these, these were our frequently asked questions that we had last time, you know, do you have this sort of device or that, you know, maybe find, because it's only after you've lived through something that you're like, yeah, that would have been helpful. Yeah. So just thinking like for something like that. But I didn't need to charge my cell phone, but I need, didn't need to charge my battery. Yes. Yeah. All right, we're going to segue to Chief Yes. Yeah. So let's move on to what we've been kind of uh, <laughs> discussing by now. Uh, item F2, which is Chief Officer Report and Activity Summary. Uh, thank you. Swan Song. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, really a significant event, and I was um, very proud and appreciative of the way literally everyone came together. And actually, you would expect um, a more panic stricken environment and a little more chaotic behavior. And actually, uh, other than calls being up, um, crime was down, and people really, uh, it brought out the best in humanity. And I think you, you looked at the, the grid, uh, PG&E ultimately took down power to about 1.1 uh, million customers. Uh, earlier in October, uh, they took down power in Marin during a red flag warning that involved 10,000 uh, of their customers. On October 26th, they took down all of Marin County, 100%, and it involved 121,000 customers. So multiply that by numbers of people, but those are the number of PG&E customers. And literally took out all of our, what are called medical baseline and our critical infrastructure. So anyone without a plan and, and power was significantly affected. And even those that had emergency power were still significantly affected. We experienced uh, multiple failures um, with generators that um, honestly, uh, although they're tested with some frequency, generally aren't required to run for hours and days. So, um, you know, you may have your own exact timing of, of your event at your home, I can tell you, Ours was 74 hours and 53 minutes, um, only because the system kept track of the exact term of the outage between October 26th and October 31st. Power was restored to everyone at 6.30 p.m. on uh, Halloween. And um, pretty significant um, in terms of the countywide impact, even though we didn't have any uh, even moderate uh, fire-related incidents as a, as a result of it. PG&E ultimately made a decision on the threat that was posed, uh, essentially that affected the transmission lines providing power to Marin County. So think of it beyond the envelope of the entire county, but look at the narrow path of the transmission lines that are serving and whether or not those were going to be affected. And ultimately, I think there was a lot of valuable lessons learned through this. Um, we did lose power, uh, emergency power, at some uh, critical uh, high-risk uh, facilities. Um, think um, convalescent <coughs> homes with the, the most vulnerable patients just outside of being a hospital um, and recognize the limitations on ex existing bed capacity to actually rehouse those. Um, one of the reasons we ended up with over 700 people at the Marin Center as an evacuation is because the expanded area of the fire uh, in Sonoma County um, affected uh, skilled nursing facilities, and they had to be evacuated. 
So not only did we end up with a very uh, mixed group of people that desperately needed shelter, we ended up people that were um, vulnerable because of medical needs and ended up really running uh, from the county standpoint to treat Greenwood as if it were just an extension of both of us. So having the county EOC here um, and having uh, San Rafael's availability. So we took that and placed and put the community center in Station 58 uh, and just considered it an extension of San Rafael. So when it became an information center, we utilized a combination of our volunteers your, in San Rafael, your volunteers in Marinwood, and we actually used uh, Marinwood uh, volunteer firefighters. And the work that the firefighters did both here and out of county, I think this Will's here. Wills is here. Wills was obviously out of county earlier in the month at the Saddle Ridge Fire in LA County. Then we had two of our members that were participating in a pre-positioned uh, strike team that was put in place for the event, the Red Flag event, additional engine companies. Um, and because we didn't have an immediate threat here, and we had one in Sonoma County when they were concerned about literally losing Windsor as the fire blew in there at uh, Hurricane Force, um, they did a tremendous amount of good. So if you get a chance to um, talk with uh, our firefighters, uh, both engineer uh, Cesar Correa and uh, Captain Brian Brackett participated with OES 358, and, and uh, they did some a tremendous amount of work here. And then at home, we had firefighters working hour after hour um, with a high degree of, of patience and skill um, treating uh, the community uh, with every bit of uh, patience and um, safety and assistance that they could provide, um, giving our means. And so, we, we, like I said, we did run additional calls, but fortunately there wasn't anything um, significant that went. Uh, the first power was restored actually um, critically to the uh, Marin General Hospital, now called Marin Health. Um, they actually had multiple failures of emergency generators. And this really happened despite your best plans and the best uh, sizing of equipment. Um, there were generator failures up and down of the entire region. And um, we had uh, uh, two generator fires at the convalescent care facilities. One involved an actual fire uh, that the generator started. And you know, like anything else, these will point out weaknesses in your in your plan and how uh, well are those systems really uh, going to do when they've got to last for 48, 72, 96 hours on end. Um, a high point of vulnerability was actually discovered when we found out that there wasn't one service station uh, available in Marin County. Uh, we obviously know there were several um, store owners that stepped up and operated. And so the two um, significant lessons I think were learned were people with a voice over internet protocol, or particularly Comcast, without the copper lines, as was mentioned earlier, had a complete failure of any phone services. Um, I think the, uh, the cellular phone services actually did better than anticipated, even though uh, about half of the cell sites actually went down but their coverage is such that we still had a fairly good concentration of cell sites that did have either power that was provided, being provided by emergency generator. There were impacts with SMART. Um, part of the difficulty there is they needed emergency power via a generator at each one of the crossings that they did not have in place. So that was um, the most significant reason behind the uh, minimal service that they were to provide, and then the actual stop and service that went on. Um, but ultimately, I think it was um, a very valuable lesson in what's to come with continued effects of climate change, the severe weather we're having, and the action that's going to be taken by uh, the public utilities. There's likely to be uh, courtroom battles and everything else waging over months and years to come over some of this and how it was handled. Um, but ultimately, I think it from the standpoint of disaster preparedness, um, you couldn't have had a better drill uh, that was very realistic. And, and although there were some 
negative outcomes, the fire threat was real, whether or not we experienced it here to the degree in Marin that Sonoma did, um, you know, is still questionable. Uh, I think we fared much better than was anticipated um, with the weather. The in part of what is troubling, and we, you know, at the highest levels, we were trying to ensure that we had information, and hopefully you got some of the inform information updates that went out, but was trying to discern uh, early on whether or not the entire county was going to be affected or not. And so early information, and you may have seen it by looking at PG&E's website, um, and they had the potential outage areas, and they were creating maps of that effect. So they had a, a much smaller uh, population in the county being affected early on, and then that was really changed at what we'll call the, the last minute, and it was determined that the entire county was out. So just when you think your planning efforts are good and in place, all of a sudden it's, no, here's what's going to occur. But um, again, I thought everyone uh, came through it pretty well. We've got some lessons learned. Uh, we'll be uh, producing a report in the near future uh, for the board to uh, consider, and then likely making some recommendations uh, for future actions. Uh, the FAQs and some of the development of information that was done, some of it on the fly during the incident, are going to be available. So there will be some updates to our website and, and information um, being produced in multiple languages and, and sourced in a way that will have hard copies to be able to be delivered um, if people aren't able to access the internet and access their phone and other things that we're back to basics and let's go to that list, let's go to that checklist uh, and information. Uh, the WIA system worked in terms of alerting. Did everyone get a, a WIA alert at some point with a, with a very loud, audible um, uh, signal that so, you received? So here they come again. Um, that's the first time that has been used. I can tell you the first uh, the first uh, message did not go out, and so it was, uh, again, another thing that was beneficial to really look at. So consider that this was a, a red flag uh, situation and a wildfire threat, but whether or not it's going to be a flood or an earthquake, you name the scenario, I think it was uh, a very, very beneficial, and again, we'll be making some recommendations. In the future, I'm uh, particularly happy that everyone came home okay, and uh, we didn't have any uh, injuries associated with the fires, and they were uh, pretty significant. And, and the work, not to be understated, that was done here at home, holding the fort, so to speak, was really significant. So very proud and pleased with the work of our uh, paid professional staff and also with our, our volunteers that, that rallied to the cause. So, um, in addition, I just wanted to mention that um, we're going to have a, a promotional ceremony uh, this Saturday, November 16th at 8.30 at Station 52. We have a new fire battalion chief that also serves uh, for Marinwood, uh, Paul Bernard, and also Brian Smith is uh, going to be promoted to fire engineer. Um, vegetation inspections are continuing. We actually have one of our Marinwood volunteer firefighters that we hired as a vegetation inspector via the city of Santa Fe, uh, Sean Wool, who's been doing a terrific job. So he's working directly in the community and is available for assistance. And um, just last week, uh, another uh, <coughs> NCCC, which is National Civilian Community Corps, uh, the AmeriCorps team, has started. And they're available to actually assist people that can't uh, provide for themselves in creating defensible space around their uh, homes and in their yards and to do any uh, work in public open space. So they're available, so we're looking forward to having them um, conduct some projects. And additionally, uh, and this was reported last month, but um, we had a good time up at Firehouse Subs. And the, the impact of those thermal imaging cameras can't be understated. So nearly a $20,000 expenditure, but it puts three thermal imaging cameras in the hands of the firefighters that can be used without, where is that thermal imaging camera, who's got it, an old one, these are all uh, brand new and they work really well and they go a long ways towards improving uh, life safety uh, in a variety of situations. So, um, and not just looking for heat, but looking for people. Um, so it's, uh, 
pretty significant, and we're very thankful for that. Um, as was stated, the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority was approved by the Marin County um, Board of Supervisors. 17 agencies uh, joined, and uh, there'll be a final hearing on uh, next Tuesday, on the 19th, um, to determine uh, whether or not it'll be placed on the March 2020 ballot. Uh, and uh, we couldn't be more supportive of that. And um, finally, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity and privilege to serve you as fire chief for the past year. It wasn't my intent um, to retire, but it's just sometimes the way things work out. And um, uh, December 6th will be my last day. Uh, Deputy Chief uh, Robert Sennett is going to be the interim uh, fire chief. Uh, for those of you that may know, uh, prior to becoming our Deputy Chief, uh, Chief Sennett served as the Larkspur Fire Chief for nearly 20 years. So um, he's a local and well uh, vested and interested and assisting um, Marinwood, and I think we'll be able to handle things until they appoint a permanent chief. They've got a nationwide uh, recruitment that's underway, um, and it's likely that uh, an appointment will be made uh, sometime after the first of the year of a new, uh, new fire chief. But it's, uh, again, been my uh, privilege and honor to uh, represent you, and uh, we're not going anywhere. We're going to continue to live in, in the community, and uh, we'll see what uh, awaits us next. So, anyway, thank you very much. Follow on a couple of these things. Just to clarify, uh, when he says as an information center and to um, Stephen's questions, uh, I was down here for every day of the thing, including the weekend days, the EOC or the Emergency Operations Center, multiple times a day and sometimes within hours of each other. We're posting very large poster sized signs with whatever updated info they had at the time in both English and Spanish. Uh, they were putting them right in front of the community center where the windows are by the lobby and these things took up like the entire windows and I would be sitting here and it would seem like less than an hour, maybe two hours also, they'd come back, take down the old signs and put up more updated ones. Um, and I also spent a lot of time next door at the fire station with the on-duty crews uh, and I, I have to commend them uh, and how, uh, for lack of a better term, just their public service uh, an engagement. They got a lot of people showing up throughout the day with questions of any nature that you could imagine that uh, some that they reasonably couldn't be expected to answer, but their attitudes, their positivity, their welcoming, their uh, reassurance that they provided everybody who walked up. I was just truly impressed and admired them greatly just for their customer service, I guess, for lack of a better term. They were really, really great. Um, in terms of Chief Senate uh, filling in on in an interim basis, uh, I, I feel I've gotten to know and work with Chief Senate quite a bit in the past year. From my perspective, from an administratively our relationship with the Fire Department of Santa Bell, I have all the confidence in the world that uh, all of the standards that Chief Gray helped to maintain and the communication and everything else will be, we're not going to skip a beat. I'm going to miss Chief Gray dearly. Um, I've grown to respect him tremendously, both personally and professionally, but I, I'm very confident that we are in very good hands with, uh, with Chief Bob Senate as well. So he's going to do us a great job, and I, I wish the city well in their search. Um, get big shoes, Chief Gray. Not sure how well they're going to go fill them, but uh, just thank you. It's, it's been a, a privilege and an honor working with you this past year. I was saving my recognitions for the last item on uh, the agenda, but if you're going to walk out, I'll speak oh, no. out. <laughs> 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 so um, uh, let's go back to the chief's report and see if there are questions from the board. Comments? Remember, I already asked. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, anything from the public, chief? Yeah, first of all, I want to congratulate Chief Gray and his retirement. And second of all, I want to ask a question because I don't quite understand. Uh, the threat assessment during these power outages, is that uh, PG&E that makes these or is that something that is a local decision? Um, the reason I bring that up, uh, day two of the power outage was 
it was a pretty calm day and, and the reason for the, the, the outage was high winds and it seemed like, okay guys, you know, get, get your act together. I grew up in the East Coast where the storms would knock out power lines but they would get, go up as, as soon as they could. So maybe you can just help me understand uh, the threat assessment. The threat assessment is all conducted by PG&E, so we have input and they receive input from uh, various resources, including the National Weather Service. We have the benefit in the EOC of actually having a PG&E rep and a member of the National Weather Service there. Um, the decisions were not made in our EOC in Warren County. They were made at the highest levels of PG&E. But as I mentioned earlier, the threat was really to the transmission line. So while we're thinking about distribution lines and maybe the, the overhead lines that are around the county, um, they weren't looking at the conditions based in some of these areas in Warren County. They were looking at the source of where the distribution lines and their <coughs> route uh, to serve Warren County and not being uh, comfortable that those conditions that they were experiencing and they were reaching uh, wind speeds in some cases over 100 miles an hour, whether or not they would sustain uh, those winds without being damaged. So okay. that's my understanding. Okay. So the other uh, concern, I, 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 both of you addressed it, I, Eric addressed it, is uh, the public outreach, which is great. I didn't know that that was happening. Um, I didn't know uh, charging stations were available. I just didn't know anything, really. Um, I don't consider myself isolated, but there are a lot of isolated people in our community, uh, especially our elders. And um, I think what would be very good in our community, it's only 2.5 square miles, um, that we do the signs like Eric's talking about, but put them, post them like in the berries and the stones, just various places around where people can get updates. Um, I'm concerned about the people that, yeah, who are isolated and, you know, they're not going to have internet access. They might not even know that it's coming up. And uh, uh, because this is so serious, uh, uh, a potential problem, you know, they need to know that. And of course, it, it can't be understated the cost, personal cost, all of us face to lost our freezers worth of food. Scotty's Market uh, allegedly lost $200,000 worth of, of food. I don't understand, I, I don't feel, I, I hate to be a doubter, but I, I don't feel safer because of that. I feel like we've had a drill, but um, I really, uh, and many people I talk to feel very manipulated by this, um, situation and uh, well anyhow I, 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 I don't think it's as simple as as we're being sold um, I think it's more complicated politically and financially I can mention too that um, we were aware and, and provided with some of the details that the damage to the uh, distribution lines um, and essentially their review starts from the point of wherever there are uh, substations. So their inspection started, and from the, it's like anything else, you really have to look for them. So if you know where they already are, that's great. But if you don't, from the standpoint of each substation, they looked at the substation and then worked away from the substation and checked uh, all of the overhead lines and did their both overhead verification and then physical uh, from the ground verification <coughs> and um, there was the reason you saw the lag in the restoration is because some areas received pretty significant damage and they didn't restore power so <coughs> um, uh, during the peak of the, some of the winds and again you may have not experienced it locally here but there were parts of Marin that did experience high winds and had uh, low humidity um, and higher temperatures and th there was damage so and whether or not it all can be justified at the end of the day i mean that's going to be left up to attorneys and others to decide uh, and uh, but i can tell you that we were uh, made aware because of the uh, information provided 
from the PG&E representative there of, of some significant damage. Fortunately, it did not occur in our community, but it did occur in other communities in Marin, and that was the reason why the delay in the restoration. It, it actually took a total of about two and a half days to find and restore everything with all the crews working. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, two quick comments. For the gas that was still available, do we know if there's any risk, just from the PG&E shutting things off, that we'll ever have to worry about not having gas? Yes, you will. Under fire conditions, there are uh, transmission lines and other things that are threatened, and they shut down gas transmission as well. But this and time they left it on, but in future... Well, they left it on here, but they, they shut it down in vulnerable areas in Sonoma. So that it's not to say that the same thing couldn't happen here, but it would also likely involve a significant fire situation as well. And it would likely, those would be the circumstances where it's not necessarily a threat, but there's an active fire burning. Got it, okay. And then you also mentioned not to assume that we will have water. Correct. Um, you might, you know. That bathtub, fill it up. Yeah. So, so it's a, it's a leak and it's a, a, a gravity a gravity fed system that requires pumps to fill the reservoirs. Uh, MMWD does not have the capacity to keep up with that on emergency power. So they were literally shoveling emergency generators from pump station to pump station to fill up reservoirs during the day. Yeah. So and they had a 24/7 cycle. So. Those um, pump stations where they didn't have a dedicated generator, they literally with a truck and a generator, we happen to have one across the street from where we live. Um, and so, and I go over there and, you know, talk to the individual and it's, you know, it's midnight and they're um, pumping, you know, to uh, ensure there's adequate capacity at the reservoir. And you might remember that the, we had three red flag events kind of back to back. and. Uh, two of them, <coughs> there was also uh, an order that went out to stop using water. And the, the full impact of that is people were actually doing more irrigation because of the potential fire threat, which used more water than they were able to actually provide because of the limited nature of their emergency power capability. So it's a pretty delicate balance, but I think it's a big wake-up call, particularly for the public utilities that all of us can be affected in these situations. So I think we're going to end up with a safer, more resilient community, but it's going to take some time to, to get there. But it's definitely at the new norm. It's costly and inconvenient during the times when everything works, but then suddenly when things... Take stop. it for granted. Yeah. Is there a way that we can do some sort of fair or educational coffee and donuts or something? Because the other day, the people that are prepared are gonna end up supporting everyone else who, like my family, who's like a day and being like, taking care of two kids, young kids without power is a lot more of a lift than I expected, whether it's like, we rec like the firefighter saying, we recommend this generator, we recommend here's your list. Like, we can all do hours of research online and be like, are we actually ready? But, you know, I think that's something that brings the community together, being like, who is like a social proof of I'm ready as everyone else. Eric, I, I love this idea and I really think that this event has sparked a lot of creativity and, and need for togetherness and getting ourselves ready. And I would love for you to get on the fire commission or, or go there and... and well, I want to be rescued. So <laughs> Being on the fire commission ensures it. I'll suggest that um, Quinn Gardner, our emergency manager, we have scheduled some get ready classes here, and we obviously have a very certain <coughs> community in Marinwood, but I think it would be timely to try to see if we can schedule a couple more get ready classes at the community center here before the end of the year. So I'll, I'll talk to Quinn about doing that. So Thank you. you. There's actually a flyer in the door for our upcoming one. Right. Right. So, um, the next uh, Fire Commission meeting will take place December 3rd. Please to become part of the conversation on an ongoing basis. Um, we'll move to item G, uh, which is Park and Recreation Matters. We'll first review the draft minutes of the Park and the Recreation Commission meeting from October 22nd. Are there any questions or um, comments from the board? No, 
Um, anything from Mr. Ryan? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you said fire commission before, so I was confused. Sorry, uh, yes. Sorry, yeah. Uh, well, I, these are actually questions. I, I was just kind of wondering what the what we had uh, invested in the fall art show that we lost due to the postponement. Um, and then the other thing is building rentals and uh, security, which which uh, security review. I understand. I watched the uh, this meeting and understand that uh, certain policies were uh, adopted. Um, I haven't seen the language, but I'm happy that it's uh, not uh, simply limiting outsiders. Uh, but I understand there's some specifics to it. Uh, maybe for the types of res. Uh, rentals and that makes sense to me. Um, I did a little bit of research and I found that uh, uh, many communities uh, for youth uh, oriented events will require extra security. Uh, many um, will limit the total amount of alcohol served. Uh, I think Petaluma had a limit of one keg per 150 people or something like that. In other words, they're really trying to limit the, uh, uh, the total amount of drinking. This may not put us in good stead, you know, it might not make us an attractive rental facility for people that, you know, want to have a blowout at a wedding, but maybe we don't really want that type of business here in the center. The other thing is, um, uh, you know, there's additional items that really weren't addressed. Uh, I've mentioned some, uh, a, a uh, modest uh, video surveillance system where date and time information <coughs> could be used in the event of uh, criminal activity. Maybe that would have uh, resulted in a, uh, a stiffer uh, set of charges or stiffer, uh, stiffer penalties for the, per the person in the spring, um, that doesn't really cost that much, and it's reasonable. Also, I know the um, at least I, we could probably check on it tonight. There's a time lock on the bathroom out here that hasn't been working for a real long time. I don't know why it's not fixed, but it, apparently it's not fixed. That is a potential place for crime. Um, things like this, uh, I think, really need to be looked at. What was looked at, it seems like just uh, broad rental pro policies, which are legit, but uh, security is, is really actually a different question. Lastly, um, when I did the uh, investigation here on the building rentals, I found that um, unlike us, uh, you know, some, of the, some community, uh, they actually look at this as a, uh, profit center that they go out after business. For example, one community, I forget where it was, they had the quinceanera package, 2700 bucks, and you get a planner, you get security, they do everything for you, decorations, whatever. Um, I think this can be a significant profit center if it is managed like a uh, business operation, and I encourage you to do that. It, uh, other communities are successful at it, and obviously, we have the demand here. Thank you. So, um, having reviewed the uh, draft minutes from the commission meeting, we will move to the uh, recreation and park maintenance activity reports. And uh, since we know that Luke is not here, we welcome Robin Burton. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we don't really have to uh, read through the report since we all know how to read. Um, and we have reviewed it. Um, are there any questions from the board? So I just had a time question. So if we're just in available hours, it must end by 11 with an hour. Of, you know, so that means like music's off at 10 on yeah, so Saturdays and 9 on Sundays? Yeah, so the event pretty much ends then. And then they have an hour to come down. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I guess, thank Luke and yourself 
for putting this report together. Um, number one, it's a comparison between last year and this year, which is um, extremely interesting and informative. Number two, this encapsulates um, the non um, special assessment and tax revenue um, and excludes administrative and overhead and provides a, a very clear picture of the profitability of our revenue streams for um, recreation programs. I think, pardon me? And it's done annually. It's done annually, and this does provide an actual P&L of those programs, separate and distinct from the tax revenues um, that are talked about, or these revenues are talked about um, at virtually every meeting. Um, why this happens once a year is because um, all of the, uh, the majority of these revenues come through during the summer months, and when the summer season wraps up, it's a perfect time to look at the entirety of these um, fee-based revenues. Um, it's an excellent report, and I appreciate the fact that you put the time into it. I also want to add that um, the reason another reason why we look at it once a year is because the summer season overlaps to fiscal years, so there is a lot of accounting going back and forth to make sure our books are correct, and they are always um, blessed by the um, auditor. And um, this report kind of summarizes the summer activities, of, again, overlapping to fiscal years, proving that we do know what's going on, and um, you are doing it quite well. Thank you very much. Um, just a clarification on the uh, building rental. Uh, it is not a new policy, but rather uh, operational changes that do not require board um, approval. Um, however, um, let me assure you, as a liaison to the Park and Rec uh, Commission, we have spent um, quite a few hours in a really rich, thoughtful discussion um, evaluating all possible options and um, really looking at trade-off of each option, um, looked at tremendous amount of research, uh, looking at other comparable facilities, uh, looking for best practices, and um, we do have to trust the um, our our park and rec commission as well as uh, looks research that what we have arrived at is the best what we can do moving forward. Um, we'll see how things work. It's always um, you know, work in progress. If we need to adjust more, we will do so. Um, but um, I think we we are solid moving forward. I am confident. So um, I'll open it to the public. So. Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, thank you. I guess a couple of your comments. Thanks for pointing out. Uh, this report, Jeff and uh, Isabel, um, QuickBooks is a very powerful program, and I don't understand why we can't get this once a month. It may not give a, a full picture, but it will tell us what uh, direction the uh, the fish are swimming. Um, and it's if it's a little bit more granular, we we understand uh, precisely the business operations. Um, which we don't really understand. Um, and then I, 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 two other things. I do think that the seating of the lawns are, are nice. Uh, we still have lots of, uh, 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 we, we still have lots of damage uh, in our open space area uh, that, uh, uh, erosion damage that uh, should be taken care of. We have these big 30 foot uh, sections of trampled earth where uh, a 10 foot wide path is all that's needed um, and there has been I've mentioned this before but there really has been no effort to improve that area 
at all. It's heavily used, um, particularly by seniors who use it as a walking path because it's nice and flat and pleasant. Um, and uh, they need stuff like safety handrails and, and park benches. And uh, I don't know how many times I should have to come here before you guys actually hear that there's additional needs out in the community that are not being addressed with our uh, substantial budgets and Measure A funds, but um, I, I don't think you're adequately addressing that. Um, uh, uh, lastly, I, I think rental policy uh, and uh, security are two different issues. Uh, the other issue is alcohol abuse in our parks, and it's, it's really actually taking place in a number of places in the park and I, I do think we need to scrutinize uh, heavy drinking that's going on in the park. Uh, there was a three kegger this summer and you know basically it's it's getting too much for a family park to to uh, to have that. Uh, I know the only complaints I actually have heard from the staff were uh, characterized as those guys who drink the Modelo's on Sunday afternoon, um, uh, apparently a Hispanic community. And I, I was really, uh, I was kind of shocked by that remark. But um, number one, we need to make sure we enforce uniformly. Two, I think um, alcohol use, heavy alcohol use is, is requ you're required to have a permit and we need to do something to make sure that these rules are being followed. This is a family community, a family, family park, and um, it really detracts from uh, uh, what the beauty that we have here in the park that everyone can enjoy. Um, that's the next part of our commission meeting is November 26th. It's all close to Thanksgiving. It will be pleasant. Yeah. Okay, great. We'll be grateful. Um, and then uh, item H is new and other business. Um, the first item is to appoint the incoming fire commissioners. We have an application, a request to be appointed from Pascal Carcenti, who's been a fabulous uh, fire commissioner, as I recall. And. Um, um, we could um, introduce a motion to appoint Mr. Percenti since we have no other candidates. Introduce a motion to vote for the staff to be reappointed to the fire commission. Thank you for the motion, Sharon. Thank you very much, Bill. And um, anything from the board to discuss? Anything from the public? We're always allowed to have people. Absolutely. Please, Evan. Um, rescue. <laughs> um, so, Tell you. Uh, get rescued uh, first. Question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And we have item number H two, which is appointment of incoming um, park and recreation commissioner. We have um, interest um, expressed by John Campbell, who has been tremendous value to our commission given his dedication, thoughtfulness, and professional experience. And in my opinion, we would be foolish not to reappoint him, and I'm super excited that he decided to um, um, pursue this further. So I would welcome a motion. So, thank you. Second. Sure. Thank you. Anybody from the board with thoughts, comments? Anybody from the public have the comments? Um, how about all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, John Campbell. And I from me as well. Very well done with that. I think it's reasonable to say thank you to Shane Valentine, who was not yes. re upping. Definitely. Um, for what, five, six, five years? Five, five years of service on the Park and Commission. Sorry to see him go, but um, honor his service. 
So, board members, items of interest, and for requests for future agenda items. Um, at this point, we can recognize the amount of time for this <laughs> five-year service on the commission. Uh, we can thank all the firefighters for your professionalism, for your dedication, uh, for all you do so fabulously well. Thank you very much. Um, I know the entire community is very grateful. And thank you to the chief who has brought so much thoughtfulness and rigor and uh, compassion. It was a wonderful package of, of again, fire chief that I wish we could keep for much longer, but I understand that there are other things to do in life. And um, I wish you all the best. And thank you so much. Um, Am I forgetting? Robin, for make and Eric for making things happen during the power outage, um, for pulling together um, emergency childcare backup for families who didn't know what to do, and for being here and holding forth um, to the firefighters again for uh, spreading the information, for being there for people who needed you. Um, I know that's what you do professionally, but that, that's probably where your heart is as well. So thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for everything. <laughs> Again, going into Thanksgiving, I'm grateful and I'm thankful. So thank you all. Future agenda items now? Sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm done with my thankfulness and, and okay. let's go. All right. Um, I'd like to take some time uh, to evaluate um, public communication and outreach to our community. Um, if I could get somebody else on the board to uh, work with me, or, or if not, I will simply work with the district manager as time allows. But I would like to um, consider uh, perhaps some improvements and some vehicles that we might use in order to um, interact with our community more than we do in these meetings. That's one thing. Um, I also want to start a review of the district health care offerings, and um, that's something that's, you know, sort of a, uh, an extension of the work that we did, that Bill and I did a couple of years ago on the OPEP. Um, I think it's time to revisit that again, and um, as I um, start those, um, or that analysis, I'd like to be able to present that um, in the future again. Yeah. Thank you. I, I like both items. Anybody who would like to work with the communication? On what? On the communication. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Uh, if nobody volunteered, I would be also. <coughs> since you got it, perfect. Um, what else do we need to do but to adjourn? I, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Comment on the. Yeah, uh, future agenda items. Okay, so. Uh, earlier on, I, I, I said uh, we, we don't know uh, how much uh, Bill Hansel is charging us. We also don't know at this very late date any kind of ballpark estimates on what you expect uh, the maintenance facility project uh, will cost. Now, I've heard the counter argument, quite frankly, it's BS because anyone who does uh, an investment get has some sort of idea of what things cost. Um, either you know it and you're not sharing it, or you're not, you don't know it. And if you don't know it, that's actually kind of criminal because all this is your legacy, and you do have the power. I recognize that you have the power, but uh, it's the cost that everyone's going to pay should you make the wrong decision. And um, I want you to make the right decision. I want people to think fondly of this project and our community going forward. And if it turns out to be a boondoggle, waste of money, there's gonna be a lot of bitterness. Um, so uh, every, I've done a little bit of research on this. Every, every project has cost estimates up front, and you should have them by now. I realize they're not going to be exact. We don't know what materials are going to cost or labor is going to cost, but we do have estimators, and that's part of 
the architect's uh, uh, responsibility. If he's not providing that for you, you should be asking why. If he doesn't produce it, quite frankly, you need a new architect. Um, but anyhow, it's your responsibility to make sure that uh, costs or controls and our investments are wise. So I encourage you to put that on uh, your next, very next uh, uh, agenda. Thank you.